Hi, it's Dre Griggs of Obsidian Wisdom. Today we discuss eight common mistakes that future retirees make and how to avoid them. When it comes to retirement, when it really comes to anything, when you really think about it, think of retirement like watching a movie. The first time you watch the movie, you're like, okay, this was a good experience. And then if you watch the movie a second time, if you're fortunate enough like me, I have four kids and they will watch the movies over and over and over and over again. And the weird thing is you always notice something where we're like, oh my goodness, they were foreshadowing that. We didn't know that that person was related to that person and they were there the whole time. And it's, it's very interesting. They call them nuggets or sometimes they refer to them as Easter eggs where they place these little bits of information inside of the movies just for people who watch it a few dozen times. And I've even seen YouTube channels devoted to that same concept where all they do is watch movies over and over again and they find these little Easter eggs. Your retirement is going to be filled with these little Easter eggs. There are things that we're going to sit there and we're going to be really thinking, if I knew then, I would have done things a little differently. And for me, that's what I'm trying to help you do is to not have that if I knew then feeling, but instead you'll have that I'm glad I knew feeling so that you have comfort as you're going into retirement, which leads very nicely into the first mistake is we don't have a plan. I'm someone that's big on planning. There should be a plan in place. How detailed the plan is, that can vary. For many, when you're talking about the most basic form of having a retirement plan, it should be, first of all, written out, and then it should have what your overall income sources are going to be and how much income you expect to receive. It should have what your expenses are, how much you expect to be going out each month, and then it should have what your overall retirement goals are. What are the things I'm going to do with my time? You can start there at the most basic level, and you can have that as your retirement plan. Now, granted, there are levels to the game, and if you're interested in leveling up, we can stress test retirement plans, which is a very fancy way of saying, hey, what if some unexpected events happen? How will that impact my retirement? We can run Monte Carlo simulations, which is a fancy way of saying in a thousand different scenarios, how many times do I make it to the end with money still in my pocket? And how many times do I run out of money in my retirement? And then if we have a certain percentage, we can adjust the plan, we can ebb and flow it, where you really can get into a lot of details. But for most people, it makes sense to start in the very basic, which is what are my income sources, what are my expenses, and what are my goals? Put that together in a plan and you will be significantly better because you're going to have more clarity, which reduces stress, which should give you some understanding of what you're going to do in times of economic uncertainty. The second most common mistake that I see future retirees make is they underestimate their overall health care costs. So I know as someone who's just generally healthy, where I don't go to the doctor very often, and I know what it's like to be like, look, I'm okay. I've always been okay, and I expect to continue being okay. I'm active, I'm healthy, I eat right, I do the right things. So what is there to really worry about? Well, the numbers show that healthcare is something that we all need to look at, especially as we get older. Whether we're talking about the fact that 7 out of 10 people, 65 and older, are expected to have at least one long-term care episode, the fact that on average that those cost about $150,000 over a span of three years. Not $150,000 each year, but about $50,000 each year. And on average, our long-term care is three years. So that's how we get the $150,000. Well, that means that we need to have a plan in place. Either we self-fund it where we have $150,000 set to the side to cover any long-term care expenses, or we start exploring long-term care insurance. Now, that is something that becomes very difficult for us to get as we get older. It is insurance, so you have to qualify and be approved for it. As a result, it makes sense normally around 50, 55, 60 is really pushing it where we start exploring these long-term care options. I have seen people go as early as 40, but for most people on average, it makes sense around that 50-year mark to say, all right, let me start exploring long-term care if that's something I want to do. Now, the reason that I often tell people to at least consider it is because on the one end, we're thinking, all right, everybody's healthy, so we're going to be fine. But what often ends up happening is when we have our long-term care episodes, we end up having to rely on our spouse to take care of us. And we have seen it where it ends up draining that spouse, where they're taking care of someone 24-7 all the time. And even if you had the tiniest long-term care policy, just to allow your spouse to have one day off a week, that would be significantly beneficial. And it's also worth considering whether we want to have a long-term care policy just for the female, because on average, the female lives about five years longer than the male. And what oftentimes ends up happening is the female is taking care of the male. It drains her emotionally, physically, et cetera. But then the male passes. On average, we pass around 73. And then on average, the woman, she passes around 78. 
And so now we have this five-year gap where there is no one to take care of our spouse. Now, we may have kids that we can reach out to and who we can rely on, but it is something that we should at least be considering. It's definitely a common mistake that we just assume that everybody is going to be alive forever, and we assume that everyone's going to be healthy forever. Now, when you look at your healthcare expenses, you and I both know that that expense goes up a lot every single year. Things like college and healthcare outpaces inflation, where you see the numbers astronomically go up. So on average, it's about $160,000, $170,000 is what you can expect to spend on healthcare over the life of your retirement as a single individual. Now, if you're a married couple, we would just double that, where you can expect to spend somewhere around three hundred and fifty dollars to $400,000 as a married couple on retirement. And that number went up 5% over the past year. That is something that we really need to think strong and hard about because it's very hard for us to have a wealthy retirement without us being healthy in retirement. And for many retirees to put the proper health care plan together, they normally need to start exploring Medicare and Medicare supplemental plans. Now, I'll put a link to a couple of videos where I go through Medicare common questions, as well as I go through some of the Medicare supplemental policies in case that is something that you want to explore and just be familiar with when you're trying to make the best decision for your own retirement. Number three on our list is claiming social security too early. Now, this is something that can vary depending on how much money you have, your overall health, life expectancy. All of these factors go into when we decide to claim social security, but on average it's about 30 to 35% of people claim social security at 62, which is the earliest that you can claim it. Now that may work for many people, but it is important to understand that there is a benefit of waiting where we can see that we gain on average about 8% every single year that we don't claim Social Security at 62. We have a benefit to wait for our full retirement age. For most of you, that'll be 67. And then you receive the full benefit if you're able to wait until 70. Now, there are a lot of factors that go into deciding when it makes sense to claim Social Security. But if the main factor, and I hear it all the time where they're saying, hey, I know that Bob died the day that he retired and he wasn't able to claim any of his social security, so that won't happen to me. So I'm going to claim social security as quickly as I possibly can. But if I was to get you to think differently about that, where instead of you telling me about the one person that you knew that passed or even the five people that you knew that passed, how many people do you know alive past 62? See, we, we sort of take for granted this idea that everybody who's alive isn't going to call me and tell me that they're alive. I'm only going to find out about the people who are passing because of the funeral. And it's a big shock. And it's, it's a really big emotional experience because that's someone that we love, someone we grow with, someone that we knew. And it's very shocking. And so it ends up being something that we really remember where we anchor this idea that I don't know how long I'm going to live. I could die just like my friend at 62. But when you take a step back, I think it's fair for us to acknowledge that the majority of the people that we know are still alive. We just haven't gotten the call for them to tell us that they're alive. So if you were to use a nice round number to make it easy for me, if you were to say I have 100 friends, how many of those friends are still alive? And I think we would probably be able to understand that the majority of them are, that 51 of them haven't passed in their early 60s. But we do know the five or 10 that did that were anchoring this emotional experience of missing out to. So we really just want to acknowledge why is it that I'm trying to claim Social Security as early as possible? Now, as I mentioned, there are a variety of reasons that you would go through everything from your taxes to your income to your overall lifestyle. There's a lot that goes into making a sound decision. But we just need to acknowledge all the factors that we are considering when we make that decision. Number four is not diversifying your income. So you guys know I'm big on having multiple streams of income. The numbers show that 65% of self-made millionaires have at least three streams of income. And because of that, I believe that we should all be striving to have at least three streams of income. The, one of the things that we need to consider is not only how our income streams perform in different economic climates, because that will vary, we need to also consider the risk that we're taking on with these different investments. And if we have all of our eggs in a pension basket or a social security basket, that may not be enough for us as we move through retirement. So when we have the ability to put a plan in place, ideally we want to create a plan that at least has three streams of income being generated because that increases the likelihood of me having a wealthy retirement and not running out of money early or unexpected. Now, I'll put a link to a video where I go through those seven streams of income, and I'll put a link to another video where I even talk about the idea of working part-time in retirement, 
because there are a variety of reasons outside of income that it is beneficial for people to consider working in retirement. The fifth most common mistake future retirees make is overspending in those first years. We are so excited to retire that you can't tell us nothing. We're taking the vacations, we're taking the trips, we're going to the amazing restaurants. We're just living our absolute best life. We have been working for a very long time and we have earned this retirement and we're ready to cut back and let loose. The problem with that is we should always have a sustainable strategy in place. And so for this, you'll need a sustainable withdrawal strategy. How much money can I spend each year of the assets that I have and I still have a great possibility of not running out of money in retirement? That is something that we should have already covered when we made our retirement plan. But I'll put a link to a video where I go through some of those withdrawal strategies for you to consider. But we should always be balancing our goals and fulfillment with our finances and responsibilities. And they do all work together when we have the proper plan in place, but we don't want to underspend where we're so concerned about running out of money that we're uncomfortable spending it. But we also don't want to overspend where we're not even considering the future that we're just enjoying the present. It is a balance and the best way that you can make that decision is with the data. You don't wanna make an emotional decision, you wanna make an intelligent decision that feels right to you. Well, all we need is the proper numbers to be able to determine how long that money should last in our retirement and whether or not we can afford some of these excursions and trips that we want. Now, I'll put a link to another video where I go through different strategies you can use to make sure that you can afford this amazing, fulfilling retirement, but you also limit the risk of you running out of money. The sixth most common mistake is ignoring inflation. So when we look at inflation, what we're really saying is, the price of things go up. And I think you and I would say, all right, I, I understand that. The price of things do go up. But what we don't often consider is how much the price of something goes up. And if you think about it, what we're really saying is if inflation averages 3%, that means that I start every year off with a 3% loss on my investments. So I should be investing in a way where I at least recover that loss. I can't take too many 3% losses over and over again throughout a 20 to 40 year retirement. So I should be making sure my investments as a whole, my portfolio performance outperforms that 3% over time. Otherwise, I run the risk of running out of money because I'm taking that 3% loss every year. Now, this is something that we really need to think about because we want guarantees. We want to be able to say, all right, I know for a fact I'm not going to take a loss here, Dre. Well, what is that return? Well, if that return is one and a half to 2%, then we've already locked in a loss that year because we're not keeping up with inflation, which is gonna be 3% and higher. When we forget the factor inflation, we are lowering the quality of our retirement over time. And you can have a variety of examples that we can go through, whether you wanna look at your mortgage, where your mortgage payment over a span of 20 to 30 years, how at the very beginning, it may have been 27 to 30% of your overall budget. But then when you get to the 25th year or so, all of a sudden your mortgage payment is only maybe 10%, 15% of your budget. Well, what's changed? You might say, well, well, Dre, I make more money. So that changed and, and that's partially true. But oftentimes you'll also notice that things like your car payment have been increasing where your car payment is almost the exact same as your mortgage payment. Where you were having a mortgage that may have been $1,000 a month 20 years ago, and now a car payment being over $600 a month is not crazy. A car payment being seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a month is not crazy. So if you were to get a mortgage in today's environment, well, naturally you would expect the mortgage to be significantly higher. And it would. It would probably be two to three thousand dollars at a minimum. Which ultimately means that if the price of everything is going up, then if my money is not, then I can't afford my lifestyle. I can't afford to get a new car. A new car now costs thirty to fifty percent of my retirement income because the cost of the cars has gone up significantly. I remember my dad, we would always tell the story of being able to go to the corner store and, and getting a pack of crackers and, and a soda for five cents, which, which I think is kind of crazy. And then my mom, she would tell the story of going to the candy store with my granddaddy and they would get a bag of candy for maybe 10 cents. Now you and I, we know that that's not happening today, that you're not going to get any of that. Now I can have my own stories where I talk about getting a bag of Skittles for 25 cents and that bag of Skittles is now a dollar that that is a 400% increase, even from my own childhood. And so when you look at your retirement and you expect to be retired for at least a decade, what we're saying is about every 20 years, your purchasing power cuts in half. That's just assuming inflation is about 3% every year. That would mean what you could purchase with a $100,000 a year lifestyle 
is now going to require a $200,000 a year lifestyle. And if you aren't taking inflation into consideration when you're doing the numbers, when you're making sure that you have enough money in retirement, then that means that you're probably going to run out of money in retirement because inflation is going to keep increasing the cost of your lifestyle. Whether you're talking about food, healthcare, or energy, these are costs that are going to continue going up and sometimes they even outpace general inflation. So we want to have a plan in place that ensures that our lifestyle remains intact and we don't risk running out of money in retirement. Number seven on our list is not preparing for taxes. Taxes is that quiet killer of most retirements. The government makes it feel like we're not being taxed a lot, but between your sales tax, your property tax, your gas tax, your, your income tax, I mean, there's taxes on everything. Your social security is taxed. When you look at the taxes that you're going to pay throughout your retirement, if you are having a plan that does not consider your taxes, then you might find out that you don't actually have the monthly income that you need for your retirement lifestyle. So we want to consider a couple things from a tax perspective. One is, where are our assets located? Do I have my money in pre-tax accounts? That means that the money hasn't been taxed yet, so in retirement it's going to be taxed as normal income. That also means that we have required minimum distributions, which could push us into a higher income tax bracket possibly. And I'll put a link to another video where I go through a handful of tax efficient strategies for you to implement in your own retirement plan. But if you have all your retirement income coming from a pre-tax account, well, that means all of your retirement income is going to be taxed at regular income tax levels, whatever your tax bracket is. And then you have money that would be after tax. So that would be money that I pay taxes on today. I then invested that money. And as a result, it depends on where I invested it, but I could have a much more favorable tax rate. And there are normally three assets that we invest our money in to access those seven streams of income is normally going to be a business, real estate, or it's going to be the stock market. And if you invest in a real estate, well, then you can get rental income and that could have tax favorable treatment versus having a normal income tax bracket. Investing in the stock market and it's been there for at least a year and a day. Well, that is capital gains tax, which generally is going to be a much more favorable tax treatment as well. And you can expect to pay lower taxes than someone whose income is coming from the pre-tax account that is generally going to be taxed at your normal income tax rate. And then you have your tax-free income. So that could be your HSA account, which is your health savings account. If you have access to that through a high deductible plan, you can put about $4,500 in that account each year as a single individual. And I believe it's about $8,150 for a couple or a family. If you put that money inside, you have what's called a triple tax advantage. The money goes in pre-tax, which means it's not being taxed as income today. The money grows tax deferred, so you're not paying any taxes on the gains as it's growing in your HSA account. And then as long as you spend it on your healthcare expenses, which we all have, then that money is going to be taken out, distributed tax-free, which is the triple tax benefit. So if you have money in there or inside of your Roth account, well, then your Roth is also tax-free. Your after-tax and tax-free accounts are nice because you don't have required minimum distributions, which means you have a lot more flexibility, a lot more choice on when and if you spend that money and then it's generally going to be taxed at a much more favorable tax rate. But we do want to take taxes into consideration because that can definitely impact the success of our retirement plan. Our eighth and final common mistake that future retirees make is they don't consider the lifestyle changes. For many of us, the thought is when I retire, my job is the most stressful, annoying thing in my current life. So as soon as I retire, I'm going to feel great. I'm going to be happy. Why wouldn't I be? I didn't like the work that I was doing. I'm not doing the work anymore. I should be happy, right? Well, well, maybe, but for how long? Or someone will say, well, I'm going to enjoy golfing. I'm going to go golfing every single day. It's going to be great. Well, okay, well, for, for how long? We're going to say, I'm going to sit on the board, read a book, I'm going to unwind, I'm going to recharge, I'm so tired. But again, for how long? For most of us, when we retire, the life that we're living at the beginning of retirement, that is not the life that's going to sustain us to the end of retirement. That we're going to have different interests, different hobbies, different experiences. And we should have our retirement divided out into phases where we decide exactly what happiness looks like. But we also want to be so intentional that we update that information periodically. As we find new hobbies and interests, we should add that to our goals list. That was from number one of creating a retirement plan. That way, as things change, you can change. You've already been adding those new goals as your needs and desires change. And you've already been keeping tabs of at least how much you can on average, expect to be able to fund these different goals. And as a result, you can now always have something in your list. I always encourage you guys to have 50 things on the list. And I know that 50 is a lot and I don't pretend it's not. But what I have found for me personally is when I list the first 10 things, those are always the squeaky wheel. 
those are things that have been annoying me for a long time and I just want to get rid of it, whether it's your, your student loans or whether it's any other debt or just a new trip or a car or something, whatever that looks like, the squeaky wheel always goes first. But then when you get to 35 to 45, you really start thinking deeply about what happiness and fulfillment looks like. Who do I want to meet? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do? What type of experiences will bring me satisfaction? And when we start writing those additional things, I know for me, I realized, I was like, man, that's actually a really cool goal that I have. I, I forgot that that was something that I was interested in, that motivated me, that excited me. But because of all the pressures that life on the normal everyday experience can give us, we sometimes forget those goals and aspirations. So when you take the time to really sit down and think on those 50 goals, what you'll find, and at least for me, is you're going to be like, oh, yes, if I can start doing some of those items, those last 20 things I wrote, I know that I have a phenomenal retirement. And then you just keep adding things. Every time you check something off, add something else on. Keep the list at 50 as long as you can. Every time something is completed, exit off, add a new thing onto the list. And just allow that to be a part of your overall retirement lifestyle because we don't want to be unhappy in retirement. We don't want to feel unfulfilled or that we're wasting our talents. We don't want to feel any stress or anxiety around retirement. We want to have a lifestyle that mirrors our growth and our change as we go through retirement. Thank you for watching the video. I don't take your time for granted. I appreciate you staying with me. I know you could have been anywhere and you chose to be here with me. If you found value in the video, I simply ask for you to like and subscribe so you can continue receiving valuable insights on how to create your own wealthy retirement system. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy life.